Yet another income ETF has been gaining traction in the YouTube community. It pays monthly dividends, and that yield is looking quite fat from behind. I mean, in prior months, of course. But just like a baddie in real life, I'm very skeptical about this fund's long-term success. Let's take a look at NEO's S&P 500 High Income ETF, or SPYI, which we can give the unofficial nickname SPYI. Despite its name, I'm not sure if the fund has anything to do with the matrix, but the first thing that pops out to me is that annualized yield of 12.29%. The fund hasn't been around for a whole year yet, so if we take the average dividend that's been distributed and multiply by 12, they get a yield of 12.29%. And we also have an expense ratio of 68 basis points. That's almost two times higher than the expense ratio of JAPI. So, if this fund is going to make it to my portfolio, it theoretically has to be doing two times better than JAPI, which also gives us in the ballpark of a 12% yield, and JAPI is about flat for this past year. NEOS has an interesting strategy, so let's find out a little bit more about it. The fund seeks to distribute high monthly income generated from investing in the constituents of the S&P 500 index and implementing a data-driven call option strategy. I like how Jeppy calls its strategy proprietary research and SpyEye calls it data-driven. I feel like all these fund managers just sit in a room and are like, okay, how can we make our strategy sound sophisticated when really we're just doing call options one month out? All right, so tracking the S&P 500 index and doing calls isn't that unique, but these next two are. Actively managed by NEOs, the fund seeks to take advantage of tax loss harvesting opportunities in addition to utilizing the SPX index options classified as Section 1256 contracts, which are subject to lower 60 40 tax rates. So before I lose you guys, let's put this in simple English terms. This is actually a way to get some advantageous tax rates when doing options. At the end of each tax year, the contracts are treated as if they were sold and bought again at their current value. This means any gains or losses you haven't realized yet are counted as taxable income or deductible losses. When you calculate your taxes on these contracts, you're going to use a mix of tax rates. 60% of the gains or losses are taxed at a lower rate called the long-term capital gains rate, and the other 40% are taxed at a higher rate called the short-term capital gains rate. It's like blending together two different tax rates. If you have losses on these contracts, you can use them to reduce your taxes in the past or in the future. You can go back up to three years to offset gains you may have had before, and if you still have losses left, you can save them for future years to offset any gains you make later on. Section 1256 contracts can be useful to gain a tax advantage, as the market-to-market -market accounting allows for recognition of gains or losses each year, regardless of whether the contract is actually sold. Again, we're blending together tax rates. To summarize, it's also giving us the chance to carry back or carry forward losses. And another advantage to this strategy is that it's another way to diversify risk. So while I really like this bullet point strategy a lot, the next one has me quite nervous. The fund utilizes a call option strategy that may include both selling and purchasing SPX index options, which may provide the opportunity for upside in rising equity markets. Uh-oh, this sounds eerily familiar. It takes me back to an income ETF that totally flopped. More on that in a second, but essentially one of the biggest problems with income ETFs is that they often forego any upside if the underlying asset does very well. So if the stock price went up a good amount in a short amount of time, you as the investor are only going to enjoy some of that return because we have agreed to give away that upside in return for those juicy monthly premiums. By purchasing call index options, this is a chance to participate in some market upside. While this might sound great on paper, it sounds like I'm previewing the Communist Manifesto. From past experience, when a fund tries to do multiple strategies at once, it generally doesn't do as hot. 
Take for example Nusi. They also did call options, but then they also did a protective put. This sounded great on paper, and many investors, including myself, bought in. Then the market did a slow bleed to the bottom in 2021 and 2022, and Nusi was rendered useless. As pointless as ESG investing, it didn't give as high of a yield as other income ETFs, and all the extra money that we were paying for protective puts, it really only saved us in a sudden crash. That's unfortunately what I believe will happen with a fund like Spy Eye, which is trying to dangle in two strategies at once. By doing this, you're getting the worst of both worlds. I'd personally rather have a fund trying to excel in one area. If I wanted growth, I'd buy a growth ETF. If I wanted income, I'll buy a pure play income ETF. Remember, for them to buy those call options, they're sacrificing money that they'd otherwise be paying you in distributions. Interestingly enough, the spy eye fund managers also appear to work at Harvest Volatility, the same people that ran Nusi. Did they start NEOs to unlock the inner workings of the matrix? When we look at Spy Eye's holdings, it's going to mimic the S&P 500, so large cap companies will dominate the top 10. We're talking companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, Tesla, and all the other big names. The fund only launched in August 2022, so it's about to hit its first birthday. While the Section 1256 contracts make it seem like the fund is tax efficient, its latest supplemental tax distribution of 19A, which is actually a law that requires funds to provide shareholders with notice if its distribution is made from a source other than net investment income. Here in one of the latest months, we can see that around 90% of the distribution is just a return on capital or a rock. Other months, such as April, for example, are even higher at 95% being rock. Rock distributions can have pros and cons, but I'd be concerned if the fund is actually generating enough income to be able to pay out those lofty double-digit dividend yields. I don't want my investment to just be returned to me every single month. So far, the dividend has been very consistent each month, being around that 47 cent mark since they first started paying dividends last September. Now, money has quickly been pouring into SpyEye in recent months. They're now up to $84 million in assets under management at the time of this recording. That's still pretty small, but they're definitely growing rapidly as they continue to get more and more attention here on YouTube. In terms of capital appreciation, since their launch last August, if we compare them to the S&P 500, <laughs> just the regular SPY, no I, and JEP E, they are all about even. SPY, no I, is doing the best at 7% versus 6.10% from SPY I and JEP E at 6.25%. But remember, Spy I and Jeppy give those juicy dividends. So I think the jury is still out on this one. I don't think it's as great as some YouTubers are making it out to be, but the tax advantages seem quite intriguing. Though I figure most hold income ETFs in retirement accounts anyway. Want a place to talk about different dividend investing strategies with other like-minded investors? What are you doing? Why haven't you joined the free dividend discord yet? Make sure you've hit that like button for a small time YouTuber. Leave a comment if SpyEye has a place in your portfolio. Thank you to all my Patreons for making this channel possible. And I'll buy, stash, and collect cashew on the next one.